It was on Sunday, 2nd March 1975, when then firebrand, Nyandarwa North member of parliament, popularly known as J.M. Kariuki, was reported missing and his body found 10 days later at Nairobi City Mochari. It is said he was assassinated at Kingsway House. 45 years later, we trace his final 48 hours alive before he was murdered. My name is Duncan Haimba. This is KTN News. It is reported that the late Nyandaro North legislator and assistant minister for tourism and wildlife, Josiah Mwangi Kariuki, a.k.a. JM, knew too well that he was living on borrowed time and that any minute he would be killed by government operatives. It is claimed that together with his bosom buddy, now deceased, former Nakuru town member of parliament, Mark Mwithaga, as they were playing darts over a drink at Nakuru's Stag's Head Hotel, then Nakuru Mayor Mburugeshua and his associate stormed the hotel, went straight to where J.M. Kariuki and Mwithaga were and uttered these chilling words, and I quote, You want to bring trouble in Nakuru? Just be warned, your days are numbered. We are going to finish you. End of quote. The statement got JM worried because earlier on, while in the capital Nairobi, Assistant Minister, the late Godfrey Gitahi Kariuki or Gigi Kariuki, had whispered to JM that a secret meeting had taken place in Nakuru and decision made that he had to be eliminated by all means. The plan was to stage a political and security scare, then blame it on him. The late Mwithaga said Gigi Kariuki had further revealed to JM that those plotting his assassination had been hosted at State House Nairobi and pieced together some excerpts of his fiery speeches as concrete evidence that the firebrand lawmaker was setting a stage for a revolution against the government. For instance, they banked heavily on JM's slogan that it was morally unacceptable to have a Kenya of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. As a concerned friend, Gigi Kariuki implored on JM that it was imperative to meet then President Mze Jomo Kenyatta and explain himself since he was considered a threat to the aging Kenyatta's reign. Jomo Kenyatta used to say that uh, in a kral, kuna kuwaga na ndume moja tu. Kengine kakijaribu kana pigwa take, wait for your time. So he was trying to say that uh, he would not mind JM being the next president, but JM should not come out with populist. He's six million beggars or whatever. James Lando Huatenge is a former member of the dreaded special branch squad who claims J.M. Kariuki was not supposed to be killed on that fateful Sunday of 2nd March 1975. J.M. was never to be killed. The intention of J.M. was an accidental death. Huatenge, who is talking about J.M.'s assassination for the first time, explains how he found himself a member of the vicious crack unit. When we joined the special branches from Sixes, we were taken to be elites. So we were given access to all government secrets because we were, we were replacing illiterate people. We were replacing illiterate people. So when we were replacing illiterate people, we were given access. So that is how I came to know these deaths of other Kenyans who were there even before. Like Tomboya, when he died when I was in Sunday too. I, had, I went to Nyati House, I went and came across those documents. After the Mburu Gishua's threat in Nakuru and the Gigi Kariuki disclosure, JM is said to have approached the late Njenga Karume, seeking his assistance in setting a debt with President Kenyatta the first. Before the appointment could be secured, J.M. Kariuki was asked by his doctor to go to a warm place like Mombasa and relax, since one of his legs had a problem occasioned by the beatings he received while in detention during the Mau Mau struggle. 
He is said to have planned to travel to Mombasa by bus on 1st March, but was quickly tipped that he was being trailed and advised to cancel the trip. Since the besieged leader knew he was living on borrowed time, he bought the idea and aborted the mission without informing anyone. Few minutes before the OTC bus he could have boarded left the capital for Mombasa, a bomb exploded and killed at least 27 passengers. J.M. Kariuki could have been among the casualties. He had escaped death by a whisker years, surviving that initial well-hushed assassination, but unknown to him, the cloud of death hanging over his head was not gone. In less than 24 hours, he was assassinated. On that fateful day, Sunday the 2nd of March 1975, JM is said to have been lured into an emergency meeting by then GSU commandant and his friend, the late Ben Gethy, where he was to be interrogated by special branch officers. Knowing what was at stake, Kariuki is said to have been hesitant because earlier his pistol had been withdrawn by Nyandarwa DC Joseph Thuo, leaving him defenseless. However, Gethi prevailed upon him to honor the summons, promising to cover him by accompanying him to the meeting at the special branch headquarters Kingsway House along the university way. JM had a sixth sense feeling that those people would harm me. So JM said I cannot go to meet those people if I am not armed. Gezi gave JM a service pistol. He gave JM a service pistol. So JM went to Kingsway House, the, the, the original Nyati House. It's called Kingsway House. JM went to that house while armed with a pistol. Nobody knew JM had any weapon. It was only Ben Gethi who knew JM had a pistol. From Oledume Road, they drove to the meeting where he found a hostile interrogation panel, mean looking men who appeared impatient. So he went there, sat down, it was an interrogation. These people are seated, just the way you attend an interview when you are going to be employed, there is the, so the panel. But at the gate, not the gate, the door, Gethi had sat there, seated. It was at this juncture that the life of Nyandarwa North legislator was brutally brought to an end by none other than his friend and GSU commandant Ben Gethi who had walked him to the gallows. JM's last minutes were this way, last minutes on earth. There was somebody called Wanyoike Thuku. Wanyoike Thuku was a police reservist of the rank of senior superintendent. Patrick Shaw was a police reservist. Waiganjo, Waiganjo was not a fake policeman. Waiganjo is a police reservist of the rank of assistant commissioner. Waiganjo has never been a fake policeman. He's a police reservist. So Wainyoike Thuku was a police reservist. That is why he used to open the door for the, the, the president. Now, uh, from Moi, they started the military man. But Jomo Kenyatta, it was the police. So Wainyoike Thuku argued with JM. And he slapped JM. He was a heavy rebuild. When he slapped JM, the teeth came out. JM went for, I want you to get this picture. JM was seated with a, with a gun. Nobody knows JM as a gun. It is only the GSU commandant. And the GSU commandant, all GSU, all GSU are sharpshooters. <laughs> There's no GSU who is not a sharpshooter. So, there is a sharpshooter there who knows that I have a gun. And when Nani was slapped, the, 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 the teeth came out. When the teeth came out, JM went for the pistol. When he went for the pistol, 
Nani shot him and fractured his hand here. Ben Gethi. Ben Gethi shot JM for the first time and disabled the hand. Arthur Wanyoike Thongo was a lethal civilian who was part of President Jomo Kenyatta's security detail and that is the reason Gethi decided to sacrifice JM by shooting him to save his job. Thongo was not a police officer but held titles of inspector of police and senior superintendent of police on various occasions because of the ties he had with Mze Kenyatta. Thongo was a youth winger in Kau Party whose duty was to provide escort and security to luminaries in the pre-independence party. It is during this period that he earned Jomo Kenyatta's trust since it is claimed he was a tough nut, ready to die or kill for the boss, and he hailed from Gatundu as well. After independence, Mze Kenyatta is said to have demanded that Thongo and his ilk be included in the lethal presidential security detail, even though he had never had any police training. Owing to the fact that they did not qualify for training in VIP protection abroad, the gang was taken to Czechoslovakia for basic training in gun handling. It is that same squad that is reported to have shot dead a mad man in Nakuru, who once rushed to the main dais at a presidential event. The victim was killed instead of being restrained from reaching the president as per the training that all elite VIP guards receive. When JM wanted to shoot him, at the spur of the minute, at the spur of the minute, Nani felt uh, if JM who was a Mau Mau person, so he knows how to handle If he kills this person, the president will ask, how did he get a gun? I gave him a GSU pistol. You see, JM shoots Wanyoi Kethuku using a GSU pistol. It would have landed him problems. So he, he, he shot him, disabled the hand. A decision then was made. But you see, JM was <laughs> going Nowadays they say I'm going So they knew that JM with a plaster and without teeth, he would say what was happening. So that is when a decision was made for JM to be killed. But then, that Sunday afternoon assassination was abrupt, both the scene and the time. There was panic and confusion reigned. The killers didn't know what to do next, what to tell President Kenyatta, and the biggest predicament was where to take JM's lifeless body. Ben Gethi shot JM twice to, to disable the hand and second to. Now after, you know when you want to kill somebody, you have to make arrangements to lead him to the place and then to... But then here is somebody who was not supposed to be even slapped. Suddenly he's dead. He's bleeding and whatever. That time when JM had died, that, that just previously before that time, the government had ordered all, all pickups that were carrying meat would be painted white with a red strip with the word meat. So they went out somewhere around Jivanji Garden, found a vehicle, kidnapped that vehicle, placed the JM there. So when the vehicle was going, JM blood was... But you see, when you are following that vehicle, ah, he what you are decorate. So that is why JM, there was not even a plan. When you want to kill somebody, you even a plan somewhere where to go. His body was discreetly taken to Ngong Forest and dumped, hoping that he would not be traced, but surprisingly, wild animals simply refused to eat the body of former assistant minister for tourism and wildlife. Funny, other people have killed other people there because the Maasai who discovered him said that people used to do this. But this one, hyenas didn't eat him. <laughs> and then he was taken there. 
J.M. Kariuki was reported missing that very Sunday when he failed to return home. A frantic search by his family and friends started. He's a seasoned reporter who can pick things. And then there was a small report, a smartly dressed African male uh, body found in Gong Forest and they took him to the city mortuary. So when he went to, to follow up, that thing had been blocked with a black, black, yeah, black man. Let's get ourselves a car. We go to the city mortuary, and we'll be fine. We'll get your camera. We'll get your camera. We'll get your camera. You'll go with a camera, they won't allow you. You'll have a feature on the road. So, we'll get your where would the way we do the same as OTC, a correlative at Angalia. Oh, oh, how? Yeah. Nanda Kuvruta, Nabruta. I look at that. Nanda Kuvruta, 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 Nanda you see, you are not interested in that, but you know what you are looking for. So you go to that man. Una muliza kwa lepo atere ili mundo lea. Ule mutu wali tole wangomu. Oh, kama ni huyo. But that's not immediate. You come back later. Kwa so little. Huyo, ushi ya kwa wana hali ya guza. I think the purpose was for, for the body to decompose quickly. In parliament, his colleagues were breathing fire and brimstone following his disappearance his former nakuru member of parliament the late mark muithaga and the late martin shikuku once stated government was hard pressed to explain the founders discussing the motion on his disappearance and moi was just saying the intelligence report the cid report we have received uh, is that uh, he was in Zambia and he left the Sheraton Hotel, Intercontinental Hotel, for Tanzania. We had a woman yelling and I wondered who it was at the parliament. And she was saying, Jem is dead, Jem is dead, Jem is dropped on us. Where is he? What did you find? He's in the mortuary, he's in the mortuary. When Moi heard this, he took out a white handkerchief and started wiping out tears. And he said, if that is true, and I've been made to tell Kenyans lies, I am very, very sorry about it. It was about 6.30 p.m. when J.M. Kariuki's first wife, Doris Nyambura Kariuki, together with other family members, stormed the chambers wailing. The session abruptly came to an end as furious MPs rushed to the city mortuary to confirm what JM's wife had reported. Already the security apparatus were making plans to sneak the body out that evening and didn't know that JM's family would return that very evening accompanied by members of parliament. We surrounded the mortuary. And uh, you know, those windows of the mortuary are opaque. You can't see what is inside. So we surrounded it. And uh, we said, we want to go in. We found the special branch officer at parliament was now bearing a label here called mortuary attendant. We hadn't even thought of him as such until Grace Onyango MP for Kisumu Town called him out by name. And he asked me, Dolu, he said, Doc, mortuary attendant, have you turned out to be now as a mortuary attendant? You changed, eh? The fellow didn't want to talk. We looked around, we couldn't find. Now, as we were about to leave, I said, let us look at that dead body on the table who is being checked out. So I looked at it, I said, this is J.M. 
But all my friends disagreed with me. The MPs flocked the mortuary and were surprised to find a special branch spy who operated in parliament was in supervising the process of releasing JM's body to a group that was wailing outside the mortuary late in the evening, a matter that is unusual. JM's body had a tag on his toe labeled a Luo gangster. His killers had knocked off three of his lower incisors to justify that indeed he was a Luo. On the legs, there was a tied label. An unclaimed body of a Luo gangster. Those words, they are in the hands of the parliament, we recorded them. And there were some Luos waiting to carry that body. They were busy just filling forms. They, then I said, this is not a Luo, this is JM. <laughs> so, we just knew these are games, don't worry. I was so angry. I knew, you know, because now when you know we are dealing with rotten people, sometimes you even stop talking to them or asking, looking for information from, you look for information from elsewhere. And the information can be available from so many others, it's not necessarily from most people. And you do it without fear. Rosemary Kariuki Mashua is the second born child of the late JM. She was in primary school when their father was assassinated. When you look at my family, there's people who would prefer to be out of the country on the 2nd of March, my family members. I think they want to be taken away from this Kenyan environment that reminds them of this terrible, terrible past. Um, what we feel is still a little, quite a lot of betrayal. Um, what we would like to see is what we were anticipating through the TJC uh, process is some type of healing and reconciliation. Um, that is still what we would like to see. Um, we'd like to change that day from being such a miserable, sad day, from being a day where we want to remember in a, in, in a happy environment that this is what JM stood for, this is, even if he died, this is how he lived his life in a positive way, you know. Right now, there's still a gloom that hangs over our heads because it's, it's, it's an issue that has not really, has not been addressed. Ten days later, on 12th March, Police Commissioner Bernard Hinga finally confirmed to the anxious nation that JM Kariuki was dead and he had been killed by two bullets. The assassination raised tension across the country, a situation that made the government uneasy amid riots that were staged by Nairobi University students, even as the government denied involvement. When we were demonstrating on March 2nd, 1975, mm -hmm. the songs, the, the slogans, well, basically to defy, yes. you know, the, the system then and say, you know, you can't win. And uh, I think that spirit still remains with Kenyans here. Yeah. If the government is not involved, why are government institutions and individuals covering up? You don't need to cover up if you're not involved. So we get the, the issue of uh, Zambia, we get the government coming in because uh, Kenyatta then comes in and takes a fly, a march past of the, the army two, three days later. Absolute marching from Tusker on Ronald Ngala Street, what is now Ronald Ngala, on to near Kenya Cinema and down what was then Government Road is now Moy Avenue to, to, to show. And the irony of it, Dungi, is this. This is what the British used to do. What was the first thing that was done when the emergency was declared? The Lancashire Fusiliers landed and that same morning marched down Delamere Avenue. <laughs> you see, it is always, tyranny is very unoriginal. <laughs> they, they use all these formulas and, and re repeat them and repeat them. So why do you do this? unless you saw that him 
his, whether he was alive or his death was a real challenge to them. As Kenyatta wanted it to be, the Kano dictatorship was, was, was really, really to scare uh, not only the revolutionaries, but the ordinary people, because it was a gross, gruesome murder. Vernon Mwanga was Zambia's foreign affairs minister at the time and JM's close ally, whom it was alleged he had paid a visit the period he went missing. He met JM's family many years later. JM's uh, death must uh, took place, as far as I'm concerned, under highly suspicious circumstances because uh, I, I have not been able to come up with a very credible story or credible information to tell me how he actually met his death. And I find this uh, very strange for a person who was as prominent as he was in Kenya. And that was very, very strange indeed. The JM had disappeared and uh, we took our buses. We traveled uh, the whole 100 kilometers to Kanyami farm. And I can tell you from Gilgio up to the farm, a distance of about 16 kilometers. There were GSUs all over. There were more than four roadblocks that we had to go through. It only took the most courageous to go to the funeral of JM. So the mood was very tense, very ugly, and very, I, I want to use the right word, very uh, compromising. The, the government exposed itself openly that they were the perpetrators. Because what were those troops doing there in the home of sadness where the family is mourning? Only true and courageous friends would come. What are those troops for? And where were they when JM was being killed? Someone like Simeon Nyashai, who was the representative of the government, sent by Kenyatta to take his condolence there, was stopped from speaking. People said, we don't want to hear the government condolences, because if they had not murdered JM, there would have been no condolence message. Uh, when he realized the going was difficult and uh, he had been stopped, uh, he also just changed tune and started singing what the people wanted to hear, and he delivered also a very national message and stopped reading the government condolence message because it was seen as false and as uh, shedding crocodile tears when they could well have done better. Mwai Kibaki was the only government official serving as cabinet minister who attended the bar. Mwai Kibaki spoke. He said, we will have to get to the bottom of this murder. However long it takes, we'll have, even if it takes 100 years, we'll have to know who murdered JM. A report by a parliamentary select committee that was chaired by the late Elijah Mwangale was manipulated by the executive. When the committee chair tabled the report, Kisumu Town Member of Parliament Grace Onyango pointed out that it had been doctored at State House. Unknown to many, Grace Onyango and Martin Shikuku had hidden a copy of the original report in Committee Room 7 in Parliament, which contained the names President Kenyatta had removed. The late Mark Muithaga was the committee's vice chairman. Well, the time came when we were now to go to State House. When we arrived, Mze was in a special room somewhere there where we were ushered in. He was fuming. He was very, 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 well, he had changed his color to almost chocolate. I think he had a lot of thoughts as to what to do with us. And he said, it appears if it was not for being polite, you would even have put my name. He was trying to amend something on the book, Zay himself, and he asked Mwangale to endorse. 
the Android council the name of Biyoko Inange and uh, Wanyoike Dungu. But the truth remains the truth. When we reached parliament, one thing that we had to do, either table the report immediately or wait for another day and it will never have been tabled. And Mwangale was told by members, quick, short speech. Don't dwell on it too much. It has been written in some little papers to, to shorten the introduction. But when I took up, the, I took over the floor to second as vice chairman, it took me two and a half days. I refused to be pushed around. And I decided to actually put the record straight. This seems to me the, the idea in the country is reconciliation. So we also would like to be reconciled. You see, JM uh, was perceived as anti-establishment. And then that just has happened for so long, for many years. Um, what we would like is, is for this narrative to change such that it is, it is we commemorate the good that JM did for this country as opposed to it's a dot from independence till he died. It's just assassination. This hardly a time we've come to celebrate as a country the gains, what he did, what he, even if he died, he died fighting for something. That thing, what, what was it that he was fighting for? And what had he done in those years that he was, he fought for independence, then he was in parliament? What is it that he did? It should be celebrated. Um, you look around this country and you see there's Arguin's Kodak Road, there is Tomboya, there's Ngala, there's all those names. But you will never find a karaoke. Why? There is Pio Gama Pinto also. Um, our case is different because you see, the, the, when, he was, when JM was killed and the government started a select committee, there was even no implementation of that select committee. So I would say, where at least Boya, they went to court and somebody looked like they were jailed or something happened, there was some end to that story. I was, there, was no, there was no closure, there was just no ending. It was, he was killed and there's a silence. So I think that um, we would like that narrative to change. We'd want to be accepted into the community of Kenyans as we should be proud of what JM stood for. Former special branch spy James Hwatenge maintains the unplanned execution of JM on that very day caught the perpetrators unawares in that they didn't have an elaborate cover-up plan which in turn exposed the government. They didn't do a good job because they didn't plan well. But uh, this fellow who was in Akuru, I don't know whether you know the case. It was not our people, it is the CID people who did it. But they did it so well. Uh, he was suspected of being a financier of crooks. And whenever he went to court, he would win the cases. So he, they, they, they took out three teams. The first team killed him. The second team buried him in a public cemetery. Then the third team came at night with a, an accident, an accident victim, they, they, they took out the body and placed there. So when she, the, the, the judge called Shifil or something, ordered the exhumation, they found this was not a person. Actually, this person was not, because the, the first team A said that he was shot and he was taken to this grave here. And then when the grave was taken, it was somebody, a drunk who was walking around and he was hit by a vehicle and claimed so this fellow was not, and that is how that person just disappeared. Any, any, any premeditated murder, usually it is hard to find the name. Whoever tries to run away from this matter and try to remove government from involvement is just playing with the intelligence of Kenyans. And uh, in this uh, uh, success of government, will continue to bear responsibility because it was government. 
Duncan Hemba for KTN News.